Hey everyone, my name is Shaki Hali. I'm a product manager on Amazon S3, and I'm very excited to talk to you about features that help with protecting your data in S3. So let's dive in. In managing access to your Amazon S3 resources, Ray just covered how you can build up your security posture by layering security controls for your data access. Specifically, how you can configure IAM policies, bucket policies, access points, and other S3 access control features like block public access to define the right set of permission for your S3 access resources. Now in this session, we continue the Amazon S3 security story and focus on how to protect your data within S3. In AWS and in S3 in particular, we'll give you a bunch of tools and controls in order to do that. I'm going to talk about two specific categories of these features today. The first is encryption. We'll talk about how you can encrypt your data all along the data path, all the way down to the objects stored in your S3 bucket. We'll also talk about how encryption really works under the hood, and then how you can use some of the new features to encrypt your data at scale. And then we'll talk about data protection features that S3 offers in order to prevent accidental or malicious deletes within your S3 environment. So let's start with S3 encryption. Here's a very simple network diagram where I have a client and a bucket. And there are three ways that customers can do encryption when operating S3 today. The first is client-side encryption. Client-side encryption is the act of encrypting data before it is uploaded to S3. In this case, you manage the encryption process, the encryption keys, and related tools. To enable client-side encryption, you have the option of using AWS Encryption SDK. The second is encryption in transit. That is, as your data travels to and from S3, you can protect it using HTTPS TLS. You can also enforce this rule in your bucket policies to ensure your buckets only allow traffic over HTTPS. And last but not the least, you have the option to encrypt your data while it is stored in S3. There are three options depending on how you choose to manage the encryption keys. When you, when you use the service manage encryption keys or SSE S3, this is the Amazon S3 manage, manage keys. It uses, it uses the Amazon S3 manage keys where you're totally outsourcing key management to S3 for your data encryption. You can use AWS KMS manage keys. KMS is AWS's key management service that makes it easy for you to create and manage encryption keys and control their use across a wide range of AWS services and your application. You can also use SSEC, which is purely customer managed keys. Maybe you're managing your own on-premises key management system and want to supply those keys to S3 to use for encryption. You can use customer managed keys in those scenarios. Let's dive deeper into, into these three options and compare them. While we briefly introduced these three options in the last slide, here we discuss how these three options compare on key access control policies, cloud trail auditing, and key rotation. We'll focus on these three dimensions as customers often care about these three characteristics when choosing their own encryption keys. So the first is S3 managed keys. S3 managed keys are fully controlled by Amazon S3. You cannot define additional key, key access policies, and the encrypt and decrypt requests are not captured in the CloudTrail logs. As a result, there are no additional charges for using this key. Moreover, each object is encrypted using a unique key, which is then encrypted by a master key that S3 regularly rotates. Second is the customer provided keys. You manage the encryption keys, and Amazon S3 uses those keys to to perform encryption and decryption of data in case of customer provided keys since the encryption key manage uh, since the, since the encryption key management is fully owned by the customer you cannot define key access or rotation policies in aws or track the encrypt or decrypt in your aws cloud trail logs so to make the encryption key management process easier and centralize it customers use AWS key management service. 
you will be able to protect your keys in a in a highly secure and available hardware construct provided by KMS and then use those keys across all your services. Like I mentioned earlier, you centrally create your keys, define the policies that control how keys can be used for your resources and audit their usage to prove that they are being used correctly. And you can also define key rotation policies for your compliance needs. Now that we have fully learned about these three options, let's look at how you can set up default encryption at rest for your buckets in S3. So if you want to ensure all your data being uploaded to your S3 buckets is automatically encrypted, we have a feature called Amazon S3 default encryption. Default encryption is a one-time bucket level setting where all object, objects uploaded into that bucket will be automatically encrypted. You have a couple of options to specify a key management strategy. Either you can manage the keys through KMS or you can totally outsource those to S3 using the Amazon S3 key. If you decide to go down the KMS option, you will have a couple of more options. You can use the S3 service manage KMS key, or you can create your own key in KMS where you get more control to define rotation, access policies, etc. In addition, you can also choose to enable S3 bucket keys for KMS, which is a new feature we launched at reInvent last year and can help you save costs on KMS requests by up to 99%. We'll talk more about this feature, but before that, let's first dive deeper into how encryption works within S3. So envelope encryption is the approach of encrypting plain text object with a data key and then encrypting the data key under another root key. The root key, which is the central master key, controls the data key, and it is the root key which is used to generate, encrypt, and decrypt the data keys. The data key, in turn, is then used to encrypt your objects in S3. Both S3 managed keys and KMS keys use the envelope encryption approach to encrypt data in S3. So let's look at an example of how this would work for an encrypt and decrypt request in practice. I'm back to my network diagram where in addition to the client and S3, I have the KMS service protecting your master key. So now when a client triggers a put request, passing along a plain text object in S3, S3 in turn fires an encrypt request to KMS. KMS then authorizes this request against its key resource policies and in turn generates a plain text key that is returned to S3. S3 uses this data key to encrypt the plain text object and then stores it durably within S3 as ciphertext along with the encrypted version of the data key that is also provided by KMS. S3 then destroys this data key as soon as the object is encrypted. Now let's look at how the decrypt call to the same object is conducted between client S3 and KMS. So client triggers a get request to the KMS encrypted object, which is the ciphertext that was originally stored using the KMS data key. S3 then fires a decrypt request to KMS and passes along the encrypted data key that was also earlier stored with the object. KMS then authorizes the decrypt call and then uses the customer master key secured within the KMS to unwrap the data key provided by S3. This unwrapped or plain text version of the data key is then returned to S3 to decrypt the ciphertext object, which is then returned to the client. The plain text version of the data key is immediately destroyed by S3. And that is how the envelope encryption and decryption process works with one central key managed within KMS. And I think now that we understand that for each put and get request to S3, you have an encrypt or decrypt call flowing over to KMS, we can also understand that when accessing millions and billions of KMS encrypted objects in S3, you have an equivalent number of calls flowing to KMS. And that, I think, is a great segue to introduce this new feature called S3 Bucket Keys that helps reduce the number of calls flowing over to KMS, 
which can help reduce your KMS request cost by up to 99%. Let's see how S3 achieves that. As we earlier, as we saw earlier, when customers use KMS keys to protect their data, S3 makes a corresponding encrypt or decrypt request to KMS to generate a data key for each put or get request made to S3 by a client. As a result, customers with millions or billions of objects could generate large volumes of requests flowing over to KMS, leading to increased KMS request costs. With bucket key, instead of using an individual KMS data key for every put and get request in S3, KMS returns a bucket level key to S3. This bucket level key is then used to derive unique object level data keys for encryption op operations in that bucket. This bucket key is time limited within S3 for a few minutes and serves as an intermediate key or a new level in the envelope hierarchy. And while this bucket key is time limited within S3, all the subsequent get and put requests can be served by this bucket key without making repeated calls to KMS. This behavior reduces the number of calls flowing to KMS and therefore dramatically reduces the cost of encrypted data in S3. To give you an example here, let's say you were using an EMR service to access 10,000 KMS encrypted objects in a single second. AWS was previously charging you the KMS cost for 10,000 calls flowing over to KMS. But now with bucket key, only one call will be made to KMS in that single second to access those 10,000 objects, which reduces your KMS request cost by 99%. Highly recommend turning this feature on if you're using KMS for encrypting your objects in S3. So that was all about encryption and the great security controls S3 offers in that department. Switching gears a little bit, let's move to data protection. So S3 offers a bunch of cool features to ensure all your objects are protected from unintended and malicious deletes. Let's look at those now. One feature to consider here is S3 versioning. The way it works is when you put a new object into a bucket, it gets a version ID. Then when you override that object or add additional objects with the same key name, you are adding a new version ID. So when you issue a get request against this object without specifying the version ID, you get the latest version of this object on top of the stack. You can also issue a GET request against a specific version ID if you want. So S3 versioning allows you to keep multiple variants of an object in the same bucket. You can use versioning to preserve, retrieve, and restore every version of every object in your Amazon S3 bucket. As a best practice, enabling versioning allows you to easily recover from both unintended user actions and application failures. It is also interesting to learn how a delete request works for a version bucket. If you delete an object without a version ID, Amazon S3 inserts a delete marker, which becomes the current object version. This way, you can always restore the previous version. And when you issue a GET request on an object with a delete marker, it leads to a 404 error. But let's say, if you want to delete an object with a specific version ID, in that case, S3 does not add a delete marker and instead actually removes that version of the object from your bucket. So that's about versioning. Highly recommend turning this feature on to prevent accidental or malicious deletes on your workloads. Next, I want to talk about replication. We think S3 replication is so much more than just creating your second, second copy of your data. First of all, you define the grain at which you want to select the data you want to replicate in a bucket. You can replicate the whole bucket or decide to replicate a prefix of that bucket or select objects that are tagged in a certain way in a bucket. Next, you can decide to protect your data within the same region or across different regions. So you can do replication in any second target S3 bucket or multiple target S3 buckets. We will continuously replicate your data, automatically generating multiple copies. 
Now, from the security perspective, this feature also allows you to replicate into a second AWS account. Customers can set up a separate AWS account and set up permissions to replicate their buckets into that specific account. Some of our customers always come back and tell us it's a great way to protect against AWS account compromise. On top of that, you can replicate into a lower storage class, which is a great way to archive while you keep your storage costs down. So that's replication, a great way to protect your data by enabling automatic asynchronous copying of objects across Amazon S3 buckets. And then the final thing that I'll talk about here in the data protection section of this talk is object lock. Object lock allows you to create immutable objects in S3. Customers often have SEC grade compliance requirements to allow write once to read many immutability, and this feature helps you enforce that. It also allows you to create potential controls on an object. You can use retention control to say, this object cannot be deleted for three years or seven years or 100 years and so on. And S3 will take care of that. It also gives you a bunch of auditing and visibility controls within the S3 inventory report so that you can understand how retention controls are being managed and changed in data over time. Customers tell us that they're not only using this feature for compliance purposes, but also for other use cases like, hey, I want to protect my CloudTrail logs from deletion for 30 days, or hey, I want to make sure my monthly backups should be immutable for at least three years. So that is object lock, the third data protection feature that I wanted to point out for you today. So that completes our S3 security story. We spoke about a bunch of encryption controls as well as some additional data protection controls in the form of versioning, replication, and object lock. Um, again, in this session, we covered encryption and data protection in, in S3. But if I were to boil down my talk to five key takeaways, those would be for encryption, you should set the default encryption behavior for an S3 bucket so that all new objects are encrypted using your preferred encryption keys when they are stored in the bucket. When you configure your bucket to use default encryption with KMS, you can also enable S3 buckets to decrease request traffic from S3 to KMS and therefore reduce the cost of encryption. For data protection, replication, Replication is a feature that customers not only use for compliance purposes, but also for data protection. Highly recommend leveraging that. With versioning, you can easily recover from both unintended user actions and application failures. So to protect your data from such unintended events, turn on versioning for your buckets. And lastly, utilize object lock that provides right once read many great immutability for your data to protect from accidental or inappropriation, inappropriate deletion of data. So thank you so much for attending my talk today. We really appreciate your partnership and all the feedback that you send us today and throughout the year to build better products. With that, I will end my talk and hand over to Nick. Thank you so much for that talk, Chaki. Uh, protecting data in S3 is right in line with uh, security being job zero. So excited to see a lot of examples of that. And uh, if it's cool with you, do you mind if I ask you a few questions that came to mind and some that I saw in Twitch chat? Sure. Wonderful. So um, I was really interested when you started talking about S3 bucket keys. Um, if I heard this correctly, it seems that customers can have immense cost savings. And I think I remember uh, maybe like up to 99% being listed there as a number. So this is clearly immense value. I just want to make sure that I understand this fully. Um, how can customers use this to achieve that amount of savings? Yeah. So, uh, so generally when KMS customers turn this on for their S3 objects, they should see some cost savings. However, customers that operate high request volume workloads are the ones to see most savings. So these would be these would mostly be customers that have like built, built out their data lakes, have big data workloads in S3, and are trying to access KMS, uh, you know, encrypted objects at really high uh, volume. So 
maybe they're using tools like EMR, Athena, Redshift, Spectrum, and, and these would be the workloads that would achieve like closer to 90%, 99% savings. Awesome. Yeah, that's a, it's a pretty clear sort of set of use cases there. I guess my question is that uh, with any sort of change to your configuration now using these bucket keys, are there any caveats uh, that a customer should consider before they go and just start implementing uh, bucket keys with KMS? Yes. And, and I would like to highlight like four things here. So first, when you turn this feature on for your bucket, it would only work for new objects in that bucket. So if you want to re-encrypt re your older objects with bucket key, you'll have to use the S3 copy API. Second, you will need to enable KMS decrypt permissions in your policies for the calling principle. Even if the intention is only to upload to S3, this is because S3 makes an extra call to KMS to verify the integrity of the bucket key. So that is something to take care of. Then the third thing is like, if you have IAM or KMS key policies that are architected around encryption context being equal to object aren't, those policies will need to be updated to depend on bucket on instead because it's a bucket level key now. Again, should only worry about this if you're using encryption context in your IAM and KMS policies. The fourth thing to keep in mind is Customers need to be aware of the fact that they will see fewer CloudTrail events for their KMS calls simply because there will be fewer calls to KMS. So yeah, those are the things that you need to be aware of before turning the feature on. And these, de these details are also included in our documentation. Wonderful. Well, hey, this this last question that I had, and then I'll, I'll be looking to see if there are any from Twitch chat, but um, maybe the answer is just that this is in the documentation as well. But um, for such a feature that helps me save so much money, maybe it's silly to ask if there's a cost associated with it, but just so that folks understand how their bill might change in shape, um, are there charges associated with using S3 bucket keys? No, this is, this feature is is free of cost. <laughs> and that's why we highly recommend turning it on for their uh, KMS buckets. Wow, I mean, this is the, the two of my favorite value propositions that anyone who's watched shows that I run when I talk about AWS, first of which is uh, value for no cost. And second is uh, some relatively simple switches that save you a lot of money. Those are two massive value propositions in my book. Um, so very excited about that. Now we have one question that was actually answered in Twitch chat and I actually just want to repeat it. And if you have anything to add Shafi, that would be uh, helpful as well. But um, it was Sven Bay in chat going to get that question up on the screen. So regarding bucket versioning, can one use S3 lifecycle policies to delete old versions or to move them to Glacier? Um, so not necessarily a, a direct security question here for your data, um, but but a good one nonetheless for how you manage the lifecycle of your data. Um, and I believe as, as Gonzalez Miguel said, or Miguel Gonzalez in chat that um, yes, one could um, and you know, Shaki, I, I've seen customers that use moving uh, data across buckets and even across storage tiers uh, to gate permissions over time. One of the questions someone asked before was, um, you know, could you uh, do remove access to data, for example, after a certain amount of time? And while there may not be an IAM uh, property that you could modify for age of data, you can move it across S3 buckets and manage it that way. Um, is that something that you've seen customers do as well? Yeah, customer use use like lifecycle policies uh, to move their data across storage class uh, all the time, and uh, uh, they, they also use the, the the int storage class instead when they don't want to like deal with the lifecycle policy. So so yes, uh, uh, the answer to your question is yes. Wonderful, and yeah, I see there is a uh, link in chat to the docs that that uh, tell you exactly how to manage those lifecycle policies. Um, wonderful. Um, just checking to see if there's any other questions from chat here. Um, someone was asking, is penetration testing allowed against S3 again to try and assess and understand the, the permissions of the buckets? And my broad answer here would be that there's a number of tools that can help one understand the permissions boundaries for their S3 buckets and IAM Access Analyzer, which Becky Weiss mentioned a little bit earlier, is probably a great start. Um, but I, I think there's probably a very, there's, there, there's a number of ways to be able to broach that topic. Any that come to mind for you, Shaki? Yeah, I think IAM Access Analyzer is, is the first way to go if you want to understand uh, what kind of access uh, 
you know exists for your bucket and then uh, i think ray ray must have covered this or originally if you want to ensure that any unintended access to your buckets is prevented make sure s3 block public access is already is is always turned on for your buckets uh, that will just help you uh, make sure that your buckets are really private and are not uh, making your data exposed to other aws accounts uh, and it, that that is unintended yeah, so I, I've been astutely listening all day to a lot of the talks, and including yours. And the the story, the security story for S3 starts to come really into the fold when it's clear that there are the tools to go bottoms up for security for, with IAM. It's clear that uh, there are optimized features that have been released for S3 that enable you to more quickly arrive at a working configuration that you want, like block public access. And then sort of you know, on both sides, both in assessing what you have implemented, but also sort of from the ground up with um, formal reasoning and 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 logic there, you can better author IAM policies through things or and assess through things like IAM Access Analyzer. So there's everything end to end from being able to build with the fundamental building blocks, um, use some of the pre-configured best practices where possible in something like block public access, um, and then give you the tools to have the peace of mind that for whatever path you've taken, that it it meets the assumptions that you're operating on. And so you have the peace of mind that your your data is secure in the way that you believe it is. Exactly.